Good morning. Good morning. Is it not a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Whether you are here in this place or you are watching online, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good.
to help you out. Are you ready? Everybody's going to help you out. Are you ready? Jesus loves me. This I know how. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. There you go. That's the Brody. That's the Brody. We're going to see if I can hack this without knocking it over. Look at that.
word in this psalm, that word is Ebenezer. I don't know all of you know, but Ebenezer is another word for altar. Uh, and this, you'll hear later about building an altar. But our Ebenezer is right here. Amen. Right here. And that is our blessing. Amen. Amen. Like 
the Friday of spring break, okay? Like we're just gonna try to roll through just that quick and get to the, the, the meat at the end. But I told them at the first service that I just think you have to know history to embrace the future. And so this is a, a good history lesson on Moses. So uh, the story of Exodus is the story of God removing Israel from slavery. And so we're going to look at that story today. But a lot of the children of Israel, um, while they trusted God and while they, while they wanted to, God to lead them and they wanted to follow God, they had so many bouts with faith and struggle and doubt, and they complained a lot. They complained a lot. So you're going to hear that word today a lot because they complained a lot. So that's what we're going to look at today as we go into this. So our scripture is Romans 12, 1. So I beg you, brothers and sisters, because of the great mercy God has shown us, Offer your lives as a living sacrifice to him, an offering that is only for God and pleasing to him. Considering what he has done, it is only right that you should worship him in this way. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, as we look into this message today, we ask God that you would pour yourself out on each and every one of us, whether we are here or listening, God, online, wherever it may be, we know that you are with us. And so, God, whatever your message would be for each individual person, we just pray that our eyes and our ears and our hearts be open to hear from you today. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. So Moses was born in roughly 1525 B.C. to a man named Amram and, Jacob, and a woman named Jochebed. Uh, Moses had a brother named Aaron and a sister named Mary, and they were both older than he was. About the time that Moses was born, Pharaoh sent out a decree that every child, every new baby, would be killed. And so as Moses was born, you all know the story from Sunday school. His mom weaved together a basket. She was able to keep him hidden for about three months. And then as the time came that she couldn't keep him hidden anymore, she took him down to the Nile River. She placed him in the basket, asked God to protect him, and pushed him away. She left, and the older sister, Miriam, stayed there with her eyes closely on the baby. The Pharaoh's daughter came with her servants to the Nile to bathe. And as she was bathing, she heard the baby cry. And so she went down to see what it was and got the basket and pulled it out. Well, Mary ran over to her and said, Would you like me to go find an Israelite woman that can nurse this baby? And she said, Yes. So Mary goes home, gets her mother, secretly the birth mother of this baby. She brings her back, and the Pharaoh's daughter says, I will pay you to nurse this child, care for this child, raise this child until it's time for me to adopt it. And so she was able to take him home under the protection of Pharaoh and raise her own baby. Now, when he turned 12 years old, she had to take him back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and gave him the name Moses, which means out of the water. And so at the age of 12, he began to be treated like a prince. Now, for the next 28 years, Pharaoh trained him. Pharaoh trained him to be a leader and a ruler of Egypt, and it gave him the skills that he would need to really take the children of, uh, children of Israel out of Egypt. And so when Moses was 40 years old, he came upon an Egyptian. Now, I, I explained to him in the first service, there's a difference in a family unit here and a family unit where we are now. And so a family unit then was, was a head of household, and he would have his spouse, um, several wives possibly, his children, he would possibly have his parents, not the wife's parents, because they would live with any elder brothers. Um, he would have any of his siblings, any cousins, anything like that would, would work for him or, or own land together. He would have his servants and their spouses and their children. He would have his slaves and their spouses and their children. So he was the head of household. He had all authority, all dominion, all say-so over this household. And so not only was he the ruler of where he was, of his kingdom per se, but he ruled his household. And in that time, the law stated that if anyone in your household did something that you believed was wrong, you could kill him. Blood or not, you could kill him. And it was completely legal. So here he is, adopted grandson of Pharaoh. And as he's 40 years old, he runs into an Egyptian beating up an Israelite. He looks and nobody is around. 
And so he saves the Israelite, he beats the Egyptian, kills him, and buries him in the sand. Word gets back to Pharaoh that he has done this, and Pharaoh's, Pharaoh puts a price on his head and he's going to kill him. So Moses has to leave Egypt and run for his life. He ends up in the town of Midian. And in the town of Midian, there's a prophet named Jethro who had seven daughters. Well, as he got into Midian, he was very tired, and he knelt at a well. And as he's at this well, these seven daughters come to get water for their father's flock. And they're going to water the, the flock. Well, shepherds come and start giving the girls a hard time, and they actually chase them off. When they leave, Jethro goes and gets water for the flock, goes to the daughters, and helps to feed and water the flock. Well, when the girls get home, and they're home early, their dad wants to know why they're home so early. Um, probably in this day and age, the dad would think we didn't do our job, right? They would just think we flaked out. But this dad wants to know why they're done so early. And so the daughters start telling him about this man named Jethro. And he says, well, go get him. We need to thank him. And so they go get him, and they bring him to eat. And Jethro is very comfortable with them and at their house. So comfortable, in fact, that Jethro ends up staying 40 years as a shepherd for uh, Moses is obtained 40 years for a chef, as a shepherd for Jethro. And Jethro loves him so much that he gives one of his daughters, Zipporah, to Moses to marry. And they end up having two sons together. So he stays for 40 years, and he's 80 years old at that point, and he's out in the field with the flock. And he sees this bush, this burn. And he goes over, and as he looks at this bush, he realizes it's not being consumed. It's just flaming, but it's not burning up. And as he goes closer to it, he hears the voice of God. And the first thing God says to him, you've heard this, you've heard it in songs, you've heard pastors say it, you've probably heard me say it, this is where it comes from. And I think it's the most beautiful piece of the story. The first thing God says to him is, Moses, take your shoes off, you're standing on holy ground. And so Moses takes his shoes off, and God begins to speak through this bush and tells him that he needs him to go back to Egypt to save the children of Israel. But they're being oppressed, they're being mistreated, and he needs them, he needs him to go back and save them. So Moses begins coming up with every kind of issue and every kind of excuse that he could ever begin to imagine. And so Moses says, first of all, who will I tell them sent me? And God said, I am that I am. So you will tell them that the I am sent you. And so Moses keeps going on and, and comes up with another excuse. And, and he says, well, how will they think I have any power? Why will they think I can do anything to help them? And God said, you will perform miracles, signs and wonders in front of them, and then they'll know I sent you. The first sign and wonder you'll do is that you'll take this staff of mine, you will take it in front of them and throw it on the ground, and it will become a serpent. And as you pick the serpent up by the tail and lift up, it will again become a staff. And he said, okay. And he said, the next thing I want you to do is take your hand, you'll put it down in your shirt, and when you pull it out, it'll be eaten up with disease. You will put it back in your shirt, and when you take it back out, it'll be fresh, and, and the flesh will be healed up just like the other hand. And God said, if they take the first sign, you're good. If not, surely they'll believe the second sign. If they don't believe the second sign, I want you to take water out of the river, pour it on the dry ground, and it'll turn into blood. And then they'll know I sent you. Well, Moses begins to remind God that he has this speech impediment, and he speaks slowly, and he stutters, and he stammers. And God says, did I not make your mouth? Did I not, did I not make the deaf and the dumb and the blind? I made you. I can make you talk. I will be your voice. You will talk. And so Moses continues to, to argue with him and kind of tells him, I'll just pray for who you send. You know, I'll just, I'll just pray. And Moses says, you know, I mean, God says, you know, isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? To which Moses says yes. And God said, he speaks well. You go get him. You bring him to me. He'll be happy to come. I will tell him what he's going to do. He will speak. I will tell you what to say. He'll tell him what to say. And that's going to be how it's going to be done. So you get your staff and you go take care of what you need to take care of. And so Moses goes back to Jethro. He had no excuses left. And so he goes back to Jethro and tells him he has to leave. He has to go. He's got to go check his brother. He's got to go see if he's even alive and that kind of stuff. So he leaves. God tells him when he gets to Egypt to meet up with Aaron. And so he gets to Egypt and he meets up with Aaron. And once they get there, they go because God has told them they have to do these signs and wonders in front of Pharaoh. To which he also says, now you need to know Pharaoh's heart will be hardened. He will not let the children of Israel go. Now don't you think at that point you would say to God, well, why am I even going? Right? I mean, I would have. But he tells him their heart's going to be hardened. 
But God had to make them go through all these steps. So they get there, and they go to Pharaoh. The signs and the wonders are done in front of them, and of course Pharaoh won't let the children of Israel go. And so that was the start of the ten plagues. Um, some scholars say that could have lasted two to three months. Some say 50 to 60 days, which is two to three months. Some say up to a year. And so nobody knows how long those plagues lasted. But on the tenth plague, the tenth plague is where the firstborn of everyone died. Firstborn of royalty, firstborn of commoners, firstborn of peasants, firstborn of captives, firstborn of all cattle. All firstborn died. And so every single house in Egypt was affected. And during that night, there was so much wailing and crying and moaning in Egypt that Pharaoh heard it. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and got him in there and said, that's it. Take, take your, your people, the children of Israel, take your flocks, take your herds, go, get out, go serve the Lord, do whatever you got to do, take them all, and bless me before you leave. And so they go. When they leave there, they're headed to the Red Sea. As they get close to the Red Sea, Pharaoh has this change of heart because people have gotten irritated with him because he sent away all the servants, right? They had nobody to serve them. They had nobody to do anything for them, and so they're frustrated. And so Pharaoh decides they're going to go after him. So he loads up all of his army. He loads up the 600 chariots, and they go after him. Well, we know that they get to the edge of the, of the water, and, of course, the children of Israel complain. They just complain. God, pull us out of here just to let us die right here. To which Moses takes the staff, he raises it up, and we know that the water split. They walk through on dry ground, and as the Pharaoh and his, Pharaoh's army goes in the middle, the water comes crashing down, and none of them survive. That's where our famous, famous uh, speech comes from that Moses gave them that says, Do not fear. Stand firm. Be watchful. And just be silent. Watch the salvation of the Lord is ours today. And so Moses gives them that speech. They cross over, and Israel sees how God worked so greatly on their behalf. And they begin to trust in God again. And they begin to trust in Moses. But that didn't last very long. It lasted three days. They go three days, and they get into the wilderness, and they start grumbling and complaining about having no water. The first water they come upon is very bitter, to which then God makes water pour from a tree, and it's sweet water. And so they last for a little bit before they start complaining again, about a month and a half, and they start complaining about having no food. And they are hungry, and they're starving, and they say, we might as well have just stayed and possibly died there. At least we had all the food and water we wanted, but here we're just dying in the wilderness, starving to death. So God tells Moses that he's going to send quail and manna. Now, he tells them how to collect that manna, a bucket on the first day, all they can eat, but then they can go back for more. On the second day, they could collect up to two all they could eat and put some aside for the Sabbath. And he gave them very specific instructions, and they didn't do it. Again, they didn't follow instructions. So it turns out that they had to eat manna for 40 years. Can you imagine eating the very same thing for 40 years? I, I can't even begin to imagine. But that was their punishment. So after they continue their journey, they enter into Rephidim and find no water. Again, no water. And Moses goes to God and says, okay, God, look, they're going to eat me alive. They're going to stone me here. We gotta, you got to give me something here. And so God says, go over there. Take the staff. I'm going to stand in front of the rock. You hit the rock, and I'm going to make water flow out, and they can have all they want to drink. Well, as they were there, the Amalekites came and started this war. And so Moses tells Joshua, you're going to have to gather all the men you can. You're going to have to go fight this war. And I'm going to go up here on top of the mountain, and I'm going to take Aaron and her with me, and we're going to be at the top. And he says, okay. Joshua goes, and they start fighting this war and all that. And every now and then, as Moses would lift his staff up, he would realize as he lifted his arms that Joshua's army was winning. Well, at some point, he put his arms down, and the Amalekites started winning. And it was kind of a back and forth until he realized finally he had to keep his hands up. And his arms got tired. His arms got very, very tired. And so Aaron and her come up and they put a rock behind him so he can sit on this stone. And each of them get on both sides of him. And they lift his arms up to where his arms stay up until sunset. And Joshua defeats the Amalekite army. Joshua and his army defeat him. And so then the Lord tells Moses to write about that battle. To write about it in the book. So everyone would know. But not just so everyone would know, so Joshua would not forget. 
And then he tells Moses to build an altar. And so Moses builds this great altar of remembrance, and he calls it the Lord is my banner. And he said, calls it the Lord is banner because he said, I lifted my arms to the Lord's throne, and as always, he fought. So as we move through Moses' life at this point, um, his wife and sons end up finding out as the father-in-law brings them over and they rejoin each other. Um, he then goes to Mount Sinai where he meets God and God right, tells him the Ten Commandments. And he goes up on top of the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And God gives him very explicit detailed instructions on how to build the temple, the, the sanctuary that is going to be built. And God uses his fingers to write the Ten Commandments on, this tab on these tablets. Now he goes back down the hill, and as he gets back down the hill, they are so very noisy that he has no clue what's going on. And as he gets to the bottom, Joshua says, it sounds like there's war in the camp. And Moses said, that's not what this is. And he gets to the bottom, and he realizes that they have built their own altar. They have taken all of their gold jewelry and melted it together to make a golden calf. And they are sacrificing things for this golden calf and believing that the other gods got them out of, out of Egypt. Moses is so angry that he throws the tablets down, crumbling them to the ground. And as that happens, the children of Israel break into war because they were being punished. 3,000 children of Israel killed that day by the hands of the children of Israel because they were in such a fight over who did what wrong. So God, Moses, and God come back together, and Mo God is about to punish them. And Moses goes and says, you can't do this. Please, please do not punish them. Don't punish us. God, you brought them out of Egypt, and if you kill them now, they're going to say that's the only reason you brought them out of Egypt was to bring them here and kill them. Forgive us of our sins. We'll do right all of them to please you. Please forgive us. To which God tells him he'll forgive him, but he won't lead him to the promised land. Somebody else will have to go with him. He'll send an angel, he'll send somebody else, but he will not lead them out. So they begin to make their journey, and as they travel, Moses decides he's going to set up a meeting tent, and he's going to ask for the presence of God to join him. And so as God's cloud of presence comes down, Moses enters the meeting tent and begins to beg God to lead them. He says, I just want to please you. I want to know you more than anything, and I just want you to lead us to where we're going. And so God and Moses end up, end up coming to a place where they come to a place of agreement and love and grace. And God says, I'll lead you because you do make me so proud, Moses. And so they end up, God tells him to bring two more tablets. God rewrites the Ten Commandments. And God says he will lead them to the promised land. And so they make their journey to the, toward the promised land. And before they get there, Moses asks if he can see the glory of God. And so God tells him he can't look at his face, but he puts him into a crack of a rock. And as he walks past, he allows Moses to see all of his glory. So God tells him that he's going to clear the promised land. Of anybody who's in there, he's going to clear the promised land. And so as they get very, very close to it, Moses goes through the land of Moab and goes up to the mountain. And God shows him this huge, vast to where he hides nothing from him. He can see the entire promised land. And he knows he's never going to get to step foot in it. So God revealed every single thing he could ever see. Moses died at the age of 120 in the land of Moab without ever stepping foot into the promised land. And those Israelites deeply mourned their leader, um, but they appreciated all of the lessons that he had given them. Joshua was now the acknowledged leader. And as he had this great anxiety, God let him know that he was going to be with him just as he was Moses. And so they knew that they had to leave where they were to make it to the promised land. They had to serve 40 more years in the wilderness because if you remember last week we talked about Moses sending the 12 spies. Joshua and Caleb came back and said, we got this, we do it. The other 10 said, no, those people are bigger than us. Well, because God had already told them he'd clear the land, they, he knew they weren't trusting him again. So they had to spend 40 years in the wilderness. As they come out of the wilderness and Joshua is just about to take them to the promised land, they have to cross the Jordan River. God made it just as miraculous as he did the Red Sea. And so as they get there and they get close to the Jordan River, Again, the waters part. They step into the waters. They take the Ark of the Covenant. The waters part. They make it across. And as the priests are still on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, 
12 men that had been pre-selected from the 12 tribes each take a stone and make it to the other side. And when they get to the first side, the, the first step they can, and everyone is out, they build an altar. And Joshua says, this is so we remember. And so I want you to hear what Joshua says to the Israelites. In the future, your children will ask, what do these rocks mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan River on dry land. The Lord your God caused the water to stop flowing. The river was dry until the people finished crossing it. The Lord did the same thing for us at the Jordan that he did for the people at the Red Sea. Remember that he stopped the water at the Red Sea so we could cross. The Lord did this so all people would know he has great power. Then they will always respect the Lord your God. They had seen the same thing that, that had happened 40 years before in the Red Sea. Here's my favorite part of it. He tells them to tell their children. Tell their children, tell their children's children. He doesn't say, tell them about this great God. Tell them about Yahweh. Tell them about uh, Jehovah. Tell, he doesn't use some huge word that kids wouldn't understand. He's telling them to tell their kids, and he says, tell them that they're God. In other words, say to Trinity, your God did it. Your God. Your God did it, Audrey. Not for kids that these children that he's telling them to tell, not so they can feel like they have a part. He's letting them know that same God that did it, maybe that's your God too. Amen. That's what he's saying to tell these children. Y'all, that's what the altars are about. If we don't build our altars as we worship, if we don't build our altars as we come through our struggles, if we don't build the altars and then tell the kids what it means, how will they ever know what God's capable of? How will they ever know that they can count on God? They need to hear our stories. They need to hear our altars, right? They need to see them. So later in, the, in down the line, when they say, what do those rocks mean? We can say, come here, let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you what God did. Now I'm just going to tell y'all, seven months of COVID, there ain't no one of us here that hadn't struggled about something. Amen? Amen. Not a one. If you did, whoo, glory be. But I'm telling you, if you were sick, if you worried about being sick, if you had somebody that was sick, if you had to miss work, if you had to miss church, if you had to miss your grandkids, if you had to miss your friends, um, if you couldn't go to the grocery store, if you thought, I'm trying to think of everything. All this stuff, we all struggle, either mad or sad or upset, whatever it was. But here's the thing. When God told Moses and Joshua and Noah to build an altar, he told them to use unbroken stones, or broken stones, undefiled by any tool, always rough, you know, that's how he told them to, told them to use the stones. And so I said, here's the thing, we come together in this place, um, you know, I'm pretty broken, I'm not perfect, I'm, I have so many faults, but God loves me no matter what. Amen. And so I'm like this old, dirty, dusty stone, but the thing is, is that when we come together, God pieces us together where we fit. Your gifts aren't my gifts. My gift is obviously not throwing candy to the balcony. <laughs> Amen. All night. But you know what? Your gift might be something that fills my gap. And that's what happens when we come together. Because we take our stones and we come together. Y'all, by myself, I'm just a piece of broken stone. But when we come together, we make an altar. And when we come together and make an altar in worship, we are the devil's worship out there. We are the devil's worship out there. But we have to come together and we have to worship in the right attitude. We have to worship in the right heart. So I just, I'll just tell them myself this morning. When I came to church this morning, I was not in a good mood because my hair is driving me crazy. Driving me nuts. So if my hairdresser's watching, look at this. I'm just telling you, my hair is driving me crazy. But I was sick and I had to miss an appointment. And as I got here, I brought my hairspray and I'm in there and I'm just messing. You know, I'm just doing all kinds of things. And as I walked out here for first service, I thought, God, it's just in my face. It's driving me crazy. And I stood there and I thought, wow, what an attitude to worship us. Right? What an attitude to come in, right? We have to know the attitude that we're coming as a worshiper. It doesn't matter what we're wearing. It doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter if we can throw to the balcony or not. God just wants us to come with an open heart, offering ourselves to Him. Amen. That's the only reason we come here. We come for fellowship. We do. We come for different things. But we come with the sole purpose of worshiping God. And so today, as you leave, you see the stones and you see the rocks. We're building an altar. 
And so as you leave today, or I think they're going to release y'all one of the times that you can come do it. There are stones here on the on the pew. There's small stones if you want a small stone or whatever. We're going to keep building this every week. And when we finally get over all this, I don't know if that's going to be when there's a, a immunization for it or if it's just going to fade away. I don't know what's going to happen. But we're going to have our altar until it's over. And when it is over and we're able to see on the other side, we're going to tell all our babies, look what God did. Look how God carried us. We made it, and we did okay. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you so much for the ways and the times that you carried us. Sometimes, God, it's not till we're on the other side of the altar, so don't ever let us forget to go back and be grateful. Don't ever let us forget to grab a stone and go back and leave it and give you glory, God. So we come today, and as we build this altar, we give ourselves to you. We give you our struggles we give you our hurts and our griefs. We give you our worries. God, we just lay it out for you in, in gratitude, knowing that whatever it is, you're already ready to take it from us. And so, God, we lay ourselves out for you, thanking you for all that you are and for the ways that you show yourselves in our lives. We thank you for all this in Christ's name. Amen. these words and worship with us.
open. As you pass the front row, there are these purple bracelets that are the, the Exodus bracelets, the stand firm, do not fear. The ones on this end of the pew are the adult bigger sizes, or if you have a small arm or a child, those down there are the youth sizes. So be sure and grab you one of those. Um, don't forget, what I said was that we had to know the history to embrace the future. You have to share your history. That's your story. That's your biography of grace. Share your history with somebody so they can embrace their future. Go in peace today. Amen. Amen.